if, if everyone improves their lives 1% every single day, by the end of that year, they'll be 37 times better. Aerobic training has already been shown to have beneficial impact on skin health. So we're talking about the skin here. Everyone wants to look better. So in the worst group, and they managed to group, group them into five different groups. So in the group that did the worst, they had triple of the percentage of responders that had moderate to severe sleep issues. Yeah, a lot of my patients who were injured with tendinopathies or you know, plantar fasciitis, they are not sleeping well. You choose the right intervention at the right time for the right patient. Um, and that should have nothing to do with your, your attachment to a treatment paradigm. Welcome to the Ultimate in Health Conversations, where we look to discuss, consider, and potentially find the humor in our quest as healthcare professionals to optimize performance. That is sports performance, psychological performance, emotional performance, and just performance in general. We hope to learn from you, to share with you, and create powerful, high-performance lives. I'm Matt Winter, Doctor of Physical Therapy with extra training in functional medicine, and I'm here with Paul McCauley, Senior Podiatrist, otherwise known on TikTok as the legendary Paul the Podiatrist. How are you doing, Paul? I'm very well. Thanks for the lovely intro there. I've been very excited for this podcast. Literally last night, I could not sleep in excitement for today's podcast. Awesome. What have we got coming up today, Paul? So today, we've got some really exciting stuff. We're going to be discussing the recent Cigna Vitality study and find out whether Singaporeans are really the most unhappy people in the world. We'll be discussing our dream of collaborative healthcare, pulling the big levers in healthcare, and a final couple of segments discussing pet peeves of our professions. And finally, we'll be discussing our favourite segment, the Magic Wand segment. Not like that. Where we or our special guest declares their one wish for their patient group to optimize their health and performance. So Matt, are Singaporeans really the most unhappy people in the world? I think that's probably a little harsh and maybe not the best word to describe it. Um, now this is really all about this vitality study that Cigna have done recently. Um, and I think before we get onto that, first of all, let's define what vitality is. Um, so I did a bit of research on this and I've come up with this. Vitality is the capacity for survival or for the continuation of a meaningful or purposeful existence. And I love that. I love that, that word purposeful. Um, I think if we look at the longevity research in general, purpose comes up quite a lot. Um, that, that reason for someone to do another day. To, to do another week or a month, especially when things in their life might feel otherwise difficult. Um, so I really like that. Um, now, I, I printed out this study, it's super interesting. Uh, here's one I made earlier. Nice. Um, and I'm gonna go through some of these facts with you and, and see if they sort of resonate with you um, as a clinician. Um, so, um, a few hard hitting ones. Um, how many percentage of people in Singapore do you think look forward to each new day? I would say maybe like 70%. Whew, that's optimistic. Um, it's actually 32%. That is really shocking for me. I, I can't believe it because like I've discussed before with you, you know, we both really love living here in Singapore. We both enjoy our lives and enjoy our jobs. Um, and we work in a very positive environment and everyone seems to be you know, enjoying themselves. It's clearly not, not the case across the board. Well, I, I, actually, I, I did have a quick look at this study bef beforehand, um, and I did ask some of my colleagues how, what percentage they felt like would be um, not look forward to the next day. And their guesses, as Singaporeans that have lived here all their lives, they were guessing 20, 30%. So, so obviously they see it more than we do. Because I, I tend to see... Uh, a more expat um, patient group, and maybe 20% local Singaporeans. And those people have chosen to move to Singapore. Okay, so they have chosen that. And then also, you know, potentially they travel quite a lot out of the country. Um, so they see, see Asia where it's somewhere different to where they grew, were brought up. But the actual locals themselves were less happy. 
that's so interesting. I think you nailed it right in that answer where you said that the expats, people that often we're surrounded by, are here for a reason. And that comes exactly back to that definition of vitality as having a purpose. Mm. So it's perfect, really. Yeah. Um, but I suppose when you do talk to that, that expat person who hasn't chosen to come and who potentially is away from their family. So say like, if we're talking about the the sort of maybe potential wives who are on deep- or, 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 or husbands, husbands the, the, the spouses. Who are, right? who are on the DP passes and potentially not working, looking after the kids, a long way away from family and help. Those people are potentially in that, that percentage who don't look forward to the next day. And I think I certainly see that here. And, and, and really interestingly, a lot of the, uh, I hate this term trading spouses, but a lot of these spouses that came with their partner that got the job here um, were very involved professionally in their prior life. They were um, potentially held high positions and now suddenly they feel like they've lost that purpose, that meaning. Yeah, I think it's a really, really valid um, observation. Um, maybe maybe one of the other reasons is the, the fe- these feelings of safety. And this is the next next fact was... Um, I know places I can always go in which I feel safe and well. The percentage of people that felt that way, 38%. Surprising? I think very surprising because one thing you hear all the time is Singapore so safe Mm. as a place. Mm. From that fact, you think, oh, Singapore is is a very safe place, so how can it be? I think there's a difference clearly between um, physical safety which is very, very apparent here, and then psychological safety. Mm. Um, And you can be, um, and interestingly, I've had this conversation with a family member recently, you you can be in a room with someone, in, in, in bed with someone and feel alone. You can be in a physically safe space and yet feel emotionally threatened. Yeah. And and I wonder like what that what it is in the environment here that leads to maybe feeling people feeling emotionally not always the safest. Mental health itself is not something that's talked about a lot in in Singapore, in Asia in general. As maybe in the Western world we talk about it a lot more. And there's a lot more campaigns to get people to talk about their emotions and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and even more so amongst men, I think. Um, I do something with uh, my best friend, um, Adam. Now, you're getting close, by the way. Oh. So, But you're, you're second, but you're, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, but whenever I speak to him, I say, um, or we say, what are you out of 10? And that's not how we're looking, although we discuss that too, but it's our emotional health. So what are you out of 10 is your mental well-being. And it, yes, and it makes each other laugh. Um, and often we revel in the other person's misery a little bit, as guys do. But it also gives us like a, um, a springboard to launch into like, mate, what are you doing about it? Like, do, do you need any help? Like, give, in giving some pointers and direction to our mates. That was interesting that like you say, I know you've told me this before. So I went and, you know, put in the WhatsApp group to my two best mates. Yeah. You know, like, how are you? One of them's like, what are you talking about for? Okay. Se- second one was like, actually went through a sort of a three-week period where he was like, oh, I had a great week this week. Got picked for rugby first team. Everything really happy. Second week was like, work was awful. Got dropped from the team. Had a terrible time. And third week was like, oh, I've been training hard. Hopefully made the team this week. So actually, he had given me more feelings than in that conversation than he had given me probably in the last two years. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, so. that's, a, that's a great starting point, right? I feel like this is something we can do better with our patients as well. And like maybe for people listening, if they can start just implementing even that, just that question, how are you out of 10 mm. to their friends? They might be really surprised about, as you found, like what it can open up um, yeah. and what, what it can lead to. That leads on to, um, I feel capable of managing my emotions really. Mm. Um, and the percentage of people that felt capable in managing their emotions was 31%. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty, pretty low. I mean, I don't even quite know what they meant by managing emotions. Um, Is that because they don't know how to express them? 
Yeah, so I, I would imagine expressing is a really good start, isn't it? But then as as you feel those em- emotions emerging, are you able to keep them in check or deal with them or respond to those emotions? And I wonder why it is that low. If you're not able to handle them well, then you might not look forward to the next day, right? Because yeah. it's tied up in that together. Maybe it's about having coping strategies. I think number one you said was really interesting, which is about expression mm. of emotions. And, and it's something I have noticed a little bit here. Um, it's that um, reticence to communicate how people are feeling. And I think this starts, it's very interesting, in linguistics. Um, so I remember I had a, very clearly I had a patient who... Um, every time I asked, how were you, would look at me like I have come from another planet. Yeah, yeah. And I'd say, is that how you're doing? She's like, uh, okay. Like, <laughs> like, why are you asking me this? Yeah. But, um, but a common thing that they ask is actually, have you eaten? Yes. So it's a lot more practical. Yeah. Um, and they really deliver on that. So if you haven't eaten, it's, right, let's get some food. Yeah. So it's a, it's a lovely sort of practical question with a direct action that follows it but it doesn't open you up to actually saying how you are now of course like where we're from the uk people ask how are you and they go i'm all right mate yeah mustn't grumble yeah and that's often where it's left right (laughs) yeah and it and the well people just have the same thing on yeah on repeat because you ask that question all the time yeah not bad mate yeah not bad yeah um but at least it gives you an opportunity to go from there yeah and so people can launch into something they want to share if they want to um so and and then i spoke to my friend who's based in hong kong and he said they don't even have words to to ask how were you mm. it's not so he he runs cafes um and he's trying to train his staff you're um, talking about adam again uh, might be non-stop all right don't be jealous <laughs> Um, so he said he was trying to train his staff to say, how are you? And, and the staff members just couldn't get it. And they said there's not even those words in Cantonese. So it's it, if it's not in the linguistics, it's not in the culture. Mm. And then it, people don't have this practice in talking about their feelings. So no wonder it then becomes difficult to start to manage emotions. You know, you don't even have that starting point. So anyway, we can, again, when we talk to psychologists, hopefully in future episodes, we can discuss this a bit more. Mm. Um all right, so let's move on to physical. We talked quite a lot about emotional. Yeah. What percentage of Singaporeans actually prioritise their physical health? You'd hope it'd be fifty percent. Like you look around, then everyone looks pretty, pretty healthy, pretty fit. See, see a lot of fit guys. Fit guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm pleased that you do for whatever flex. Also, you want. fit girls. <laughs> Each their own. It's fine. Um, around the streets and in the gym that I get to, which yeah. is great. You you said that you work out at um, Anytime Fitness. No, somewhere else as well. The Cricket Club. Name dropping. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you you were saying you were working out at the Cricket Club and you, you saw like quite a lot of older people working out. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So not just the, the youngsters. So throughout, and you see around the HDBs yeah. um, and the outdoor gyms that they're well used by the older population. So, so this was the impression that I got as well. So I was quite shocked about this, that there's um, 38% of Singaporeans prioritise their physical health. I don't think it's terrible. Yeah. But it could be a lot better. Yeah. And, and anyway, I mean, there's loads of these stats, right? But when we put them all together, the ultimate vitality score was like super interesting to me. Around the world, 20% of people in this study f- describe themselves as having high levels of vitality. What percentage of Singaporeans do you think said they had high levels of vitality? Well, from these, from these low stats, it's got to be lower than I've been estimating so far. So maybe 15%. 10%. Wow. Yeah, and I think, I think we probably answered the why already so we'll look into some a few more details behind that in a second i think well i i I did a bit of research uh into this actually i read through the study fully can you believe that what is going on whole study read through it um it mentions stress levels in singapore Uh, and this is something which you've given me a bit of like coaching on that you actually ask your patients out of naught to ten how stressed they are um and since I've been asking patients, they've been telling me that they, at least every everybody I've asked is above a 7 out of 10. Um, even some admitting they're 10 out of 10 most days, which to me is, 
I'm shocked because for me, I'm seven out of ten, like one day every six weeks. Okay, so I was really shocked at this point. But in this study, they discussed stress levels in Singapore remain really high, with 87% of people expressing that they experienced stress in the study from this year. And the global average is actually 80%. Mm. So it's way above the uh, the global average. It's like 10% up. Yeah. Which probably affects their vitality a lot. Why do you think that is? Well, Singapore in general is, is a fast-paced environment. And I know that they're pumping a lot of cash into bringing the financial sector over, trying to take over Hong Kong. So there's a lot of sort of high high flyers big businesses here people are working hard and also it's i suppose it's a bit more expensive place so you have to work harder to be able to afford to live here and maybe the stresses of everything going up in price and being able to afford it i mean that's going on all over the world in terms of the price increases but yeah it is a it is a very fast pacing a uh, very fast paced society isn't it? and it's almost just a city right singapore doesn't really have a city then um, you know, countryside outside it. It's all a big, one big city, um, and and it. There's a term here called kiasu, right? And I think this is the right time to bring it up, which, which, it basically describes this um, concept of not wanting to come second. Everyone wants to come first and win, and you kind of see it trying to get through the the gantries at the MRT. Um, everyone wants to get a little bit ahead. Um, and I think that starts really young for Singaporeans as well. Um, at school, there's so much competition. Every kid is doing um, uh, what they call enrichment classes outside, which I'm not sure how enriching they are because they're certainly just studying with their head in a book, which is really sad for me, not not potentially developing other skill sets, yeah. um, communication, expression. Yeah, it's um, very different to how our week, often it happens on the weekends, very different from, from us Westerners who usually it'll be sports on the weekends or even like uh, dramatics and things like that that's all yeah dramatics and and exploring play mm. and i think there's loads of evidence that you know kids really benefit from play and what that does to their brain like, having said that we don't get it right where we're from either and education is really suffering but there's certainly a balance to be had um really interesting stuff do you think it affects our patient groups that we see yeah well it, it definitely does um maybe we could be better at trying to ascertain that from our patients. Because like you say, if we're talking about Singaporeans and we talk that they don't really ask how, how are you? They're not used to answering that question. So when you ask it, you don't really get a really honest um, response or they don't think about it too much because they're shocked you've even asked it. So yeah. we could look at how we can delve into that a bit bit better. So I think what some people don't always realise is that stress actually has a direct impact on the tissues as well. There was a really cool study done in 2005 on wound healing. He loves a study. He does. He does. Um, and then what they found was, is that when you're stressed, actually 170 genes are changed um, to a state that is contrary to wound healing, that affects wound healing negatively actually a hundred shut off completely um, and what they found was that there was a 40 percent increase in healing time as well um, and this bias towards cell death and inflammation and like as a podiatrist someone that deals with wounds a lot venous wounds arterial wounds whatever that might be that's surely a conversation we need to be having with our patients yeah actually this study is you know, very relevant, Matt. So thank you very much. So I will definitely be asking more patients about their stress levels uh, in regards if they do come in with a wound, as it's never something which I've directly considered. Actually, there was there was another study a bit off the cuff here, but um, looking at tendon sheaths. Um, so it's, we look at tendons a lot. You obviously look at Achilles tendons quite a lot. And, and what they found, this is really cool, um, was that, again, in stressed individuals, there was a, a greater amount of receptors for adrenaline in the, what we call catecholamines, in the tendon sheath. Now, what adrenaline does is it shuts down blood flow um, in the peripheries. Um, and so what we're getting is effective reduced blood flow to the tendon sheath, and that's going to affect healing. Mm. Um, and a lot of what we're trying to do when we treat tendons is what? 
increase blood flow. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if we're doing shockwave, we're trying to in- increase the blood flow to that tendon. Uh, and actually, this is a conversation which I had with someone yesterday. Um, this exact study, which because you previously told me about it, I've gone and you know told this patient about it, which is definitely relevant because he's one of the people who's told me that he's had 10 out of 10 stress. So it's so important to, to think about stress in more than just like, you know, that feeling of like being tense, which often people will, but it's actually how it affects your body um, and your muscles and your tendons as well. Yeah, the direct physiology, the physiological effects. Awesome. So um, in trying to complement this study, I did a little bit of research on sleep. Um, and because sleep certainly something that I try to delve into when I'm trying to work out why people are feeling a certain way. Um, and in the YouGov study of a thousand Singaporeans, um, it turns out only about 25% are getting the recommended seven to eight hours sleep. And I think in a sense, this, this would really contribute to some of these feelings of vitality. Why do you think it is that Singaporeans aren't sleeping? Definitely, well, because it's such a safe place um, outside, I noticed that I live in HDB and there's a lot of kids running around late at night. Yeah. So from a young age, they're staying up till 10 o'clock. When I was a kid, my mum is sending me to bed at 7 p.m. until I was about 13, 14 years old. But there's eight-year-old kids who are up till 10, 10 30 at night because it's so safe outside, the parents can just let them play and it's absolutely fine. It gives gives the, the parents a chance to you know get some respite, I suppose. And if you're doing that from a young age, then as you get older, you're only going to stay up later and later to give yourself more time to to do your things yeah if you're not looking forward to the next day you don't want to go to bed either do you yeah exactly so yeah so two points there like this feeling of safety actually conversely having a negative effect on lifestyle and it's like one of the things they do to create safety here is there's lights everywhere it never gets dark maybe this is why kids are up and i think we've discussed this before and you said in the uk once you get dark you want to you want to get out of there yeah yeah get home. I, uh, actually i went back to the uk recently november time it's winter time and i went to my friend's house in in a village and i i was like it's so dark i can't see the road i can't see anything this is so weird because singapore no matter where you go there's lights and everything is lit up the the um sidewalks are lit up you know the food centers malls and It's just lit up all night long. Yeah, so there's this like ambient light. So your brain never gets the signal to go to sleep. You're never going to get that darkness is what triggers the hormonal changes, gets that melatonin going. So we actually go to sleep. There's loads of podcasts that talk about sunlight in the morning, but darkness at night is so important as well. I think the other thing with sleep is it really affects behavior. Um, It affects decisions that we make um, affects our mood um, is that is that something that that you found with your patient group as well I would say that now that I'm being more of a general pra- practitioner general practitioner of podiatry it's something that I'm asking more about finding out and I'm finding out that people sleep a, a lot less than I do um, I'm not the peak of physical health but you're not bad, uh, not bad. <laughs> cheers mate but it's um, definitely a lot of my patients who are injured with tendinopathies or you know plantar fasciitis, they are not sleeping well. Um, so there's a clear link. But I, you know, I don't see those healthy people because why would they be coming to see me? Yeah. So it's almost like a very it's a very select bias, right? Um, the interesting thing, much like stress, um, lack of sleep has been linked with poor. Uh, tissue healing as well and then probably the um the effects of lack of sleep so the way that people use stimulants um such as say smoking for example um caffeine although caffeine can actually be quite beneficial but if we talk about um uh, smoking that then affects tissue healing as well um and in terms of pain itself and there's been there was another study with this uh, here we go again (laughs) yes um where they found that poor sleep predicts pain onset months in advance and return to good sleep predicts reductions in pain Mm. um so there's this sort of bi-directional is that the right word yes no it's not no it's not i I just went with confidence i thought it was okay yeah well hopefully no one will notice (laughs) Um, but um there's there's an effect both in predicting improvements and in predicting um, problems with regards to pain. So really interesting, something we certainly need to be talking about more with our patients. Have you got any tips for sleep? 
Yeah, there's there's loads of tips for sleep, actually. Um, and I think we'll go over it a little bit more in our next episode on pain. Uh, but I wanted to mention one, um, which is really simple. And it's just to keep your bedroom for sleep only and sex. And the reason for that is actually really interesting. And there, there really was a study on this as well, um, which was looking at insomniacs. Um, and they what they did is they asked the insomniacs to, so when they couldn't sleep was to move out of their bedroom, um, go and do something else, sit on the sofa outside and only return to the bedroom when they felt sleepy. And, and what happened was over time, the brain started to associate the bedroom with feeling sleepy. And the, as James Clear talks about in the book Atomic Habits, um, it's the context forms the cue. And you get this cueing that, oh, I'm in my bedroom. Now I feel should feel sleepy and therefore I go to sleep. Um, so I think that's a great tip for anyone. Um, you can't get to sleep. Get up, move out. And don't work in your bedroom because then your brain sees that context and the cue is, oh, I should be working. I think the hard part for a lot of people would be saying, Matt, you know, my, my office is in my bedroom because that's all I can afford. Um, what would you tip? be for those people yeah so actually James Clear talks about this as well but it's it's then segmentalizing or, or or breaking up that room into certain sections and you only go into one section when you're working and you only go into another when you're sleeping um, something I said to a patient yesterday was like when you're finished working at your desk cover it like literally just get a cover like a, a, a blanket and put it over your desk job done that's the end of work um, so you change that environment visually. And we're really, as humans, so much of our cueing is, is visual. While we're on sleep, I want to kind of combine some of the stuff we're talking about and finish with one major, really interesting study, um, which, was, um, which we'll put a link for below, which is done in 2022. And, and what this was, it took, it took a group of people that were experiencing pain and managed to predict who in this group would get better by looking at a number of different factors and none of them had anything to do with structure apart from pain severity at onset of the study. Um, can you guess what any of these might be? Stress. Yeah, so yeah, stress was certainly in something that had a little bit of an impact. Sleep? Yes, yeah, sleep, definitely. So in the worst group, and they managed to group, group them into five different groups. So in the group that did the worst, they had triple of percentage of responders that had moderate to severe sleep issues. Any others, what? Paul? Um, diet? Yeah, like yeah. really closely related, but um, obesity. Okay. Um, of course, there's other things that impact obesity, but yeah, diet would be a main one. Um, in that worst group, in the group that did the worst, them, they actually had the highest body mass index and twice the rates of obesity. 50% um, of that group were classified as inactive. Okay, so, so basically what you're saying is that obese, inactive, and had the highest levels of pain. Yes, correct. Those with the highest levels of pain had the highest rates of obesity and were the most inactive. Um, okay, now, so what, what would your top tip be from that? Oh, that's that's huge. So there's there's lots of barriers or, or lots of reasons why people might be putting on weight or being inactive. Um, we all know that we need to exercise more. We need to eat better. So it's about how do you first of all investigate the reasons for that person as an individual, um, and then secondly start to remove some of their barriers to eating better or exercising. And a lot of that is about making very small realistic changes with people, um, and. And, and starting with something that might be as, as little as I want you to walk for three minutes a day. Yeah. Um, I want you to um, swap out like a high sugar drink, like a Coke, for like a Coke Zero. Yeah, or you know, and set just half the amount of rice on the plate, mm. and and just starting with things that are really realistic and attainable, and making habits out of them. Yeah. Um, Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits, exactly. I did take a lot of that from James Clear. It's a great book, and I don't get any revenue from that. Yeah. The last one was actually recovery expectation and self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is really about um, people feeling that they have control in their lives and to being able to take control of managing their pain. Um, and I think that's something we talk about quite a lot in healthcare. Yeah, definitely. It was some, something which, you know, I had three Achilles tendinopathies yesterday. And a lot of the stuff that, especially with one particular patient, is 
trying to yeah, encourage um, him that there's lots of other factors which could be contributing to his pain. And how can he take control of those factors? It's not, the pain is not purely just um, from mecha mechanics. Yeah, or the injury itself. Yeah. There's so much more going on there. And I think in life in general, we often feel so much better, even when we're in you know, dire straits or we're going through tough times, where we feel that we're in control of the situation or there's the, at least the potential for control. Yeah. Um, so I think in that study, what you can see is we've got already sleep, um, obesity of weight, levels of activity, psychology in terms of expectations of improvement and self-efficacy. Um, and we're almost dealing with, and that's a really holistic approach that we need to take. Um, and it's going to need collaborative approach from healthcare professionals to really work with that patient or person optimally. Yeah, and I think that's that's our dream, isn't it? Yeah. Having that collaborative effect. Like we do work closely together in clinic. We don't work for the same company, but we're lucky enough to share the same space. And we do, you know, regularly ask each other advice on our patients. Just take you for a few minutes and, you know, ask you a few exercises that I could add for this patient who's got a bit of knee instability or something like that. So for us, it's, it's our dream. Or just getting a second eye on the patient, right? And we all, we all have slightly different training and background. Um, and even if we had the same training, you know, you remember things at different times, you have different experiences as a healthcare practitioner that you can add. Um, we had quite an interesting one recently, didn't we, that young lady with uh, calf heart. cramps. Yeah, yeah, so she was a uh, yeah, very hypermobile girl. Structurally, I had we had made some orthotics for her and changed that, but she was still getting still getting the cramps. And um, Matt came in, did an assessment, asked a lot of questions, and because of his background in functional medicine, he um, suggested that the, the girl could start taking magnesium for the, the cramping. And I know actually personally that's helped me before. And she started taking it and she's been much better since. She's able to do a taekwondo with no pain now, which is fantastic. Yeah, and I think this is just like one example. We do it a lot. We pop in and out of each other's consults quite a lot. And, and it's great because it shows the patient there's no ego, right? We're, we're willing to learn from each other to get someone better. And um, I just don't understand why this isn't done more often. Um, and very much in, I'm sure patients will have experienced this as well when go and see a clinician. It's just that clinician. And they can often be quite protective of their own uh, specialty and, and resistant to opinions from outside clinicians, doctors, other practitioners. And I don't understand where that comes from, apart, well, apart from money. Yeah. Um, because, you know, in the hospital where we both worked, we work in teams a lot. We round in teams. Um, I worked in intensive care for a while and respiratory physio. An amazing place to work because you've got the physios, the nurses, the anaesthetists, and potentially you know, any other surgeon or, or medical provider that's been working on the patient dis deciding on, for example, does that patient get weaned from a ventilator? And that's how you get effective care. And if we can somehow bring that out into this environment, wow, patients are going to love it. We're going to get great results. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm well up for it. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've, we've talked about collaborative healthcare, and I think um, we've talked about some things other than structure that predicts improvement in people and patients in performance. I think this leads us really nicely on to the pulling the big levers in healthcare. Um, do you reckon you ready for that, Paul? I am definitely ready for that. All right. I think we'll start this by you coming up with what you think the big pillars in healthcare are? So I think we've talked about one for most of this podcast. It's got to be sleep. Sleep's definitely there. How about uh, diet? Yeah, absolutely. Nutrition. Nutrition's a, it's such a wide topic. Yeah. Um, and I think it's not been typically spoken about a lot in physiotherapy, in my profession. Um and I don't know about in podiatry. Is it, is it? Do you learn much about it? Not, not particularly, to be honest. Yeah, because um, I, I mean, my degree is mainly focused on national health service um, stuff and mainly just diabetic wounds. Um, and so it would be something I would have taken on as time has gone on, um, but mainly just learning it from you. Uh, I like to provide, <laughs> um, but um, like even in wounds, like simple things, increase protein intake. 
yeah. like vitamin C for collagen. Like, you know, there's simple things um, in, in athletes um, who are getting injured a lot or um, have hormonal imbalances, just getting enough calorie intake can be enough to make a big difference. Um, we don't have to be nutritionists to give very simple advice. Um, but we do need to know when we can refer out. Like, for example, um, neuropathies, so nerve issues, B vitamin deficiency is like huge in that, about magnesium. And then there are foods that are pro-inflammatory and pro foods that are anti-inflammatory. Um, and of course, as people make the, uh, I say wrong, but un slightly more unhelpful dietary choices, there is a higher risk of obesity. And then we know obesity not just causes uh, increased load, Mm. in on joints but also is um fat is pro inflammatory again. Yeah. So like it's it's almost um irresponsible of us as healthcare professionals to not consider nutrition as part of the picture. And, th and that is where the literature is going. Yeah. And it's uh, well it's important to have that conversation with your patients, but it can be quite a tough conversation to have as well. Yeah, how do you how do you go about attacking that or having that conversation with a patient? So well often I'll ask um whether they have lost any weight in the last six months or gained any weight in the last six months just to see sort of like where they're at and what their view is on them. Um, some some people might be like, oh yeah, I think I've you know, put on since COVID six or seven kilos. I really need to lose it. Um, and then it opens up the com opportunity for a conversation to say, oh, okay, how, how can you do that? What does your diet currently look like? Are there some small changes that can be made? Yeah, that's great. I love what you said there about... Um, asking whether they put on or lost weight because um, it, it's, it's so much less judgmental and you don't know where someone's baseline was anyway so it could have gone either way and weight gains and weight loss particularly weight loss can be a real red flag medically so we've got to be asking those questions yeah i love that approach um so we've done nutrition um, we've done sleep um any others that you can think of so uh, drinking yeah. So, so yeah, drinking. Yeah, um, drinking is part of uh, substances. Alcohol. alcohol. Yeah, alcohol. Yeah, not so, water. Yeah, orange juice. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so drinking is part of substances. So in that we've got um, alcohol um, and smoking and any other sort of uh, drugs. Um, and smoking's huge, right? Smoking, we talked about it briefly, affects uh, wound healing. Yeah. But it really is like a predictive factor in almost everything that can go wrong in the body. So, yeah, that's that's one. Um, I'm not sure. Tell me, tell me more, man. Tell me more. <laughs> so we've got um, stress management. Um, we've we've touched on that quite a lot today. Um, social connection. Um, I love that one. Community. Um, and I think purpose and meaning that we, if we go right back to the beginning of the podcast, kind of links in nicely to that. So it's not everyone finds purpose and meaning in their work, but they can find purpose and meaning in their family mm -hmm. or their communities. Yeah. Um, and so having that social connection is really, really important. Yeah, yeah, definitely, for sure. Well, we see here in Singapore that often people live with their, their parents for a long time. Yeah. Their, their grandparents have you know, close around, around that area. Yeah. So they've got a good family community. Yeah. And supposedly, well, this might be a fake news, but I saw her on Instagram on a reel. It must be, must be right. It must be real. Um, it wasn't on your Instagram, was it? <laughs> that actually Singaporeans uh, are the like longest living people um, in the world. Yeah. See, I saw that as well. So, yeah. so Singapore has been added to the list of blue zones, right? Yeah. Um, I find it really like false advertising. Because we've just discussed some things. We've just discussed it. And, and I think the issue is, and it might be right in terms of um, the actual length of their lifetimes, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I've, I've got two issues with it. One is what's the quality of that lifetime? Yeah. Right. And the other reason is, um, are they living that long? Because just the healthcare here is so good. Yeah. You know, the access to, to doctors and healthcare professionals, um, people are just sustained longer from the outside. To me, that, to then call it a blue zone is is false advertising and it leads people to 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 not make changes that could otherwise be beneficial and, yeah. and make that even better yeah i also saw on a reel that singaporeans are the fastest walkers in the world which is definitely not true. Not. not true so what whatever you see on instagram might not be true unless he's saying it well then or, it's definitely true yeah. I, I only yeah. speak facts so that's uh, social connection, and the last one, and I think this is like this is what we talk about the most, is general activity levels. Um, now, 
I am going to get into the weeds in this and say more than just general activity, I think strength training is the safest, most impactful thing that anyone can do with an exercise. Um, I think it's really important to express that muscle has been redefined as an endocrine organ. That means it's, it's, it's something that signals for other things. So it's not just something that makes you look good on the beach. Don't mind that. No, don't mind that either, to be honest. <laughs> Guilty. Um, and, and it gives us that structural support, but it's actually sending out messages. Mm. So when we exercise things like interleukins, interleukin-15 is the main, the main one. Sending oh, out... Yeah. Me- oh, yeah, that one. Your favourite, right? Oh, yeah, interleukin. Yeah, Inter-leukin. yeah. yeah, yeah Luke, right. Luke. Good old Luke. Good old Luke. Yeah. Um, sending out messages for things like, like um, maintaining bone mineral density. Um, or hormonal balances, reducing inflammatory environments. Um, Now, um, there's great studies showing that in older adults, twice a week of exercise is enough to reverse genes for aging. But I'm going to play on people's vanity here. I found a very, very cool bit of research done only last year. Um, Go on, say it. Matt, he loves the research. It's, it's great. This is honestly, you will like this. Ah, go on, tell right. me. Tell me. So I'll probably be telling everyone next week. You will be, and you'll be saying you came up with it. <laughs> so in 2020... Well, it'll be true, because everything I say is, is true. It's a fact. So in 2023, they took a group of Japanese women, and they wanted to compare the effects of aerobic training versus resistance training. And actually, aerobic training has already been shown to have beneficial impacts on skin health. So we're talking about the skin here. Everyone wants to look better. And what the research hadn't done was looked at resistance training. And they actually found that when with, in the resistance training group, in addition to skin elasticity changing and this sort of upper dermal, so the outer layer of the skin changing, they actually increase skin thickness as well, which is something that reduces as we age and adds to that, that look of aging. Um, and they they reasoned that exercise and resistance training has an anti-inflammatory effect and it has this improved expressions of genes uh, for collagen synthesis and proteoglycan, so the, the, ma- the makeup of the skin itself. How cool is that? Resistance training can actually make us look better. Love that. Yeah. That Imagine, is fantastic. That is brilliant. Yeah. Imagine how we'd look if we didn't train. Oh, well, we've seen some people, haven't we? We'll mention no names. <laughs> So yeah, there you go. I just wanted to share that strength training is the way forward. So there we go. We've covered all the pillars of lifestyle medicine and hopefully over the coming episodes, we'll sort of dial down into them even more. Yeah, with our special guests. There's so much to discuss though, Paul, like with patients and I, I, sometimes I sometimes I do struggle to get all this information out. I was wondering like, how do you, how do you as a clinician extract this kind of information from your patients? I think the most important factor is the subjective assessment. So, which for some people may not know, it's just when we're asking our patients questions about their condition, about their lives, about their, you know, their the sort of habits and the patterns they have in life to try and work out, you know, and get an understanding of like how have how they got injured and what factors could be affecting their pain. Um, and how and how we can make their or ch- make changes to their lifestyle that can improve their pain. Yeah. Um, the subjective assessment is is often, I think, it's often rushed. Um, I heard a stat about this um, that we can make a huge percentage of accurate diagnoses just on the subjective assessment. What do you reckon that? percentages of accurate diagnoses just from talking to the patient not looking at them examining them my guesses so far today have been pretty poor but for this i'd probably go with 60 percent yeah I, I would so i would say even more oh, so it's seven wrong, yeah. you underestimate yourself <laughs> maybe for you it's 60 <laughs> <laughs> i'm not so, asking the right questions <laughs> so it's a uh, yeah 70 and i've heard even up to 90 um so just just by hearing that patient narrative um, can I tell a story about a lecturer I had? Come on. All right. Tell us about Anne. How do you know it was Anne? <laughs> I've heard it You're before. Clever. 
Oh, I must be so boring. Right, Anne Child was this incredible lecturer I had. She was um she set up a, a mental health service for physiotherapy in Nottingham. Now that's quite rare in itself, a mental health service in physio. Um and she said something which I've never forgotten. She said that if you just let the patient tell their story, and she said the word story, they will give you all the answers you need. And as a junior uh, physiotherapist clinician, you often want to get all your questions out, make sure you covered all the bases. But as you get a little bit more confident, you can really sit back and let that patient talk and extract the information you need. Um, and it's amazing how many of them will give you the answers you're looking for. Yeah. Sometimes it's really important to sit back and let them talk because they can be nervous. It might be the first time you've met them. They don't know you. Um, and they might be scared to tell you all these things about themselves and about their lives. So it is important to ask the question, pause, and actually let them answer. No, don't try to interrupt them, guessing what they're going to say, um, and already like making an assumption on your diagnosis within the first few minutes. The other thing that you get from letting patients tell their story is you get the, what seems like potentially irrelevant information that can have a big impact. So like, you know, patients start going on a story about, oh, and I've got three kids, and Timmy started school and he's got his exams, I'm so stressed, I'm helping with his homework. All oh, right, like, where, where, do you, where does he do his homework? Oh, well, you know, he sits on the floor because he's only at primary school. Oh, so where are you sitting? Also on the floor. Mm. And they're spending two hours a day sitting on the floor helping him with his homework. Well, no wonder they've got lower back pain. Yeah, And often, though, you can tell by the way that they're telling you the story what type of person yeah, yeah, like you can tell if someone is a highly anxious, highly stressed person from the way they communicate to you. Yeah, and they can, and often people will go from one thing to the next, bang, 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 all these things within t two minutes, and you're like, whoa, whoa. We go, sudden, and then or, or then they're, they're, they're scattered all around. They've got ADHD, anxiety, and it's like, I bet this person's not sleeping very well. Yeah. and just in their manner of speech, you can pick it up. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Okay, so we've extracted all this information on on lifestyle and um, and patients' background and their pain and all of that. The question is, because this is what a podcast is about, how does that impact performance? I think, like, first question to ask is, what the hell is performance? Hey, are you talking about my unbelievable performance on TikTok? It's all about you, isn't it? If you haven't seen it, it's at Paul the Podiatrist on TikTok and Instagram, and soon to be YouTube too. Any more plugs? No, that'll do for now. Might, <laughs> yeah, cool. might come back to it later. That's very generous of you. Um, okay, so let's, let's start with the definition of performance. Um, now, actually, when I looked into this, performance was largely related to the arts. Um, but outside of the arts, it's defined as the action or process of carrying out or accomplishing an action, task, or function. That is really mundane. It's pretty boring, though. Isn't it? That is boring. Yeah. yeah. So I looked into high performance because I actually think that's what we're referring to. And this was actually much more interesting. So it's succeeding above and beyond standard norms over the long term. Now, I think we all want to be above standard. Everyone yep. wants to be special, right? Um, but we certainly want to be above the curve. Yeah. Um, and I like the word long term because what it reminds us is that it's not about the quick fix. Yeah. Um, it's not just about, oh, I love a quick fix as well. I love a manip. I yeah. love a bit of dry needling. Yeah. Um, everyone loves that. But it's about how we encourage patients to make changes that affect yeah. their life long term. Exactly. And we ultimately, we want to get them better and we, in the best possible way, we don't want to see them again because we want them to live a better life and not hopefully not get injured again. Yeah. And... And because by fitter, stronger, yeah. performing to a higher level. I think the quicker we get rid of someone in a good way, the better th for them. Yeah. But hopefully they go off and tell their friends about us anyway. So I, don't, I think as healthcare practitioners and clinicians, we don't need to come from this point of scarcity. Yeah. Oh, I need to go. And I, it makes me so mad when I hear about... Um, clinicians, and I hear this from patients, said, oh, I have to come back twice a week forever, once a week for the next year. It's like, you don't know. You, yeah. And you should, your goal should always be to get someone looking after themselves. And that increases their self-efficacy and that's going to improve their outcomes. Yeah, so definitely helping them to create those smaller habits, those 1% um, improvements, which will add up. If, if everyone improves their lives 1% every single day, 
by the end of that year, they'll be 37 times better. Oh, Atomic Habits. Well, re <laughs> read the first page. <laughs> so yeah, compounding effects of small changes, very, very important. Um, and I think what we're going to do over the next episodes is get a guess on um, that have specialist expertise to help us optimize um, performance in different areas. Yeah, I'm really excited for that. So yeah. yeah, it's definitely my New Year's resolution to myself is to sleep better. So yeah, I'm trying to optimize that at the moment, looking at different pillows and things like that to get a pe best possible setup. So we're looking at pillars and he's looking at pillows. <laughs> Oh, that's bad, isn't it? It's about time I became a dad for that kind of humour. Um, okay, brilliant. So we round up there on performance. Yeah. Um, let's move on. So it's time that we had some therapy. Yeah, about time. So our pet peeve section. I've been looking forward to this. A chance for us to rant about something from our profession that we get frustrated about. We hate. Okay, so I think, you know, I'm feeling charitable. So I'll let you... Go ahead and talk again. Oh, wow. This is, this is a great day. <laughs> um, okay, this is something that really winds me up, so I'm going to have to take a deep breath here. Um, it's physios that say they are exercise-based or manual therapy-based or something-based. You're not, or you shouldn't be. You should be a clinician first. And what I mean by that, and I think it comes back down to the word physiotherapy. This is the problem. The word physiotherapy and the word therapy implies that we do something after the fact, that we provide a therapy. And actually, the process starts way before that. The process starts when the patient comes in, you're, you do a medical screening, you do a structural assessment, you look at all of the things that might contribute to where they're at today. We talked about today the pillars of healthcare. Mm. And then you choose the right intervention at the right time for the right patient. Um, and that should have nothing to do with your, your attachment to a treatment paradigm. Because when, when it is, then you're putting your ego and your belief system before what's right for the patient. And that is not the right way to help. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic, fantastic point. So yeah. moving your on, your to turn, my turn. Thankful, oh, I feel better already. Yeah, I'm allowed to talk now. <laughs> uh, you got one minute. So my pet peeve is podiatrists who give insults to everyone, and it just gives podiatry a bad name because not everybody needs insults. Insults should be used for specific instances. You know, for example, we use them to offload certain injuries, areas of the foot, um, so that we can take pressure off certain tendons. Instead of using just purely orthotics, changing the shoes can make a huge difference. Like, I would prefer people to know us as a clinician that is fantastic and has such good knowledge about shoes, because that is what we are. It's not we're not just people that prescribe insoles. There's way more to us. We we are. We should be considered in the same sort of uh, rank as a physiotherapist. You know, we did a lot of our studying together and we do actually, depending on who is your podiatrist, we do do manual therapies as well. We do have knowledge of exercise prescription. We don't just need to be considered as people that give insoles. But now the research is sending us away from just using insoles. And actually, the shoe manufacturers are giving us shoes that will offload in the same way an insole previously would. So, you know, podiatrists that just give insoles, stop it. Yeah, brilliant. Do you feel better? I feel a lot better. Oh, yeah. that was great. Can we do that tomorrow as well? Yeah, you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, finally, what you've all been waiting for. Our magic wand session. Session? <laughs> <laughs> So that's even worse. Okay. Right, do that again. <laughs> We've all been waiting for that, now, haven't we? <laughs> Finally, what you've all been waiting for, our magic wand section. Not like, like that. that. So, Paul, this is where we come up with our one wish for our population group that we serve. What is yours? I can go first. I will let you go first. Woohoo! Yeah. Big day. So mine is stop wearing Crocs, okay? For everybody, it is 
like wearing a cushion. If you put your foot on it and you stand on one leg, you're literally going to wobble side to side. It's not giving you any stability. They cause more injuries than it's worth. So it's either better to get a arch support slipper or just wear shoes. Shoes with laces are much better than Crocs. Nice. <clears throat> you like, Hopefully, you yeah. like Crocs? Love Crocs, yeah. No, I don't. I, I like, don't wear Crocs. I think they're awful. Hey. I cringe. Yeah. Crocs are only, uh, only in the operating theatre. Not for me. But, I shouldn't uh, imagine them wobbling around the operating theatre. Well, no, that's. I mean, that's where they started, wasn't it? Yeah. But like, oh. Just disgrace. Awful. Right. I, I prefer if someone puts at least a strap around the back. Imagine, but, imagine like high precision surgery wobbling around. Yeah, exactly. Little, that's probably why they use robots now. Yeah, hopefully the robots aren't wearing Crocs. Right, is it, is it, is it my go? Yes. All right, brilliant. Mine is sleep. I want everyone to get seven to eight hours sleep a night and even start that before midnight. That first phase of sleep is where you get your growth hormone released so you can start to heal. It predicts healing. It predicts good hormonal balance. It predicts recovery from pain. God, if we can get everyone sleeping better, our jobs would be so much easier. So um, I'm going to work on this as well myself. I'm not perfect at it either. Um, so, yes, yeah, sleep is my wish for this one. And there we have it. Thank we you. made it. We did make it. Yeah. We did make it. Whew. Yeah. Podcast one, eh? Yeah, I know. Looking uh, forward to the next already. Um, thank you so much for listening and joining us on our collaborative journey of optimizing health and performance. Please do smash the like button. Remember to subscribe and comment anything you'd like to hear or see from us in the future and future episodes. Next episode, I'll be interviewing our own Dr. Matt about his A to E's of dealing with pain. So get some sleep and start strength training. See you soon. Thank you.